2013. My name is Kat Amato, and I'm the Sales and Marketing Director at Cogno. I'd like to take a moment to also thank our partner community who have invited their members and clients to attend today's event. Cogno partners with many different business segments to provide online training courses directly from their website so that their members and clients have a convenient place to purchase the training that they need. In addition to software training, you can also purchase human resource, social media, business management, and leadership training to name a few of the topics available. So be sure to check out their website to search the various options. If you're not a Cogno partner, email me today at info at cogno.com and I will send you information on how to sign up to become a Cogno partner. It's easy and completely free of charge. Today's guest host is Pamela Conway. And Pamela has over 20 years experience in the technical education field. A graduate of Purdue University, Pamela joined CompuWorks in 1991 as a technical writer and software trainer. After many years providing traditional classroom training and curriculum development, in, two, in 2000 she became part of CompuWorks management team, concentrating on implementing new training modalities and playing, uh, planning training and support projects for Fortune 500 companies and government agencies. Pamela has lectured throughout the United States and Europe and is our host today. Welcome, Pam. Thanks, Kat. I appreciate that. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. I'm really excited about uh, doing this webinar for you. We're going to talk about not all of the new features in 2013, uh, because I only have you for an hour. But I thought what we would do is I could take a look at just a couple of my favorite new features that are across the major, uh, the major applications within Office 2013. So I'm going to show you a couple of features that are new across all of the applications. And then we'll dig into Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and Outlook. And I'll show you a couple of things that I think are handy to know in each of those and hopefully whet your appetite for a little bit more of Office 2013. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the first item, which is looking at a couple of features that exist across all of Office. And I'm actually just going to do it right here in PowerPoint. So I'm going to be working live within the application. I'm just going to escape out of the presentation mode for a second and drop down into PowerPoint proper. And one of the first things I want to show you is the return of task panes. So we had a lot of task panes that existed. Uh, in Office um, 97 and in Office 2003, but they disappeared in 2007. They have reemerged in a way that I think makes really strong sense. So let me show you one example of that. When you're working in PowerPoint and you have an object that you've created, although this would also be true in Word and Excel as well, and you right click on it and you want to format the shape, What's going to happen now is a task pane is going to appear over on the right-hand side of the screen. And the reason why I love this is because it's going to stay available for it to me as I work with this shape. So, for instance, you can see here I've got my fill options if I wanted to change the filling color. I've got my line options if I wanted to, let's say, uh, make the line dotted or dashed. And I also have from here the effect options. So if I wanted to have this have a reflection on it or cast a shadow or if I wanted to give it a glow, I can do all of that directly from here. Now I could do all of these things before, but I would have to go up to the format tab on the ribbon and I would be able to play with the fill shape here, the outline, the effects, and I could play with other options here. But the fact that I've got this all in one area I think is really handy. And also I can click on it. It's multi-paneled, so you can see that I can click on text options. And now this section of the format ribbon here, the Word Art Style section, this is now available to me directly off, off of this panel. And the same thing here, you saw I have three icons. We've got um, this icon for fill and lines. We've got this one for effects. And then I've got this one for the size and the positioning if I wanted to, uh, to input coordinates on where I wanted to go on the slide. So all of these things that normally I would do off of the format tab on the ribbon, I can now do from here. But that allows me the flexibility of being positioned on another point on the ribbon. So I think these task panes are smart in the way in which they brought them back. 
And it's also something you don't have to have on all the time. So if I use the X in the corner, it disappears. And if you prefer occasionally just using the Format tab on the ribbon instead, it hasn't gone away. The task pane is just an extra option for you, which I think is pretty cool. So that's one of the features that you're going to find will pop up across all of Office. And you'll see other types of task panes as well as you work in different applications. One of the other things that exists across all of Office is our ability now to save our content to the Microsoft Cloud Share called OneDrive. So I don't know how many of you have OneDrive accounts. They're free, so you can certainly set one up uh, at no charge. It's just uh, OneDrive.com, O-N-E-D-R-I-V-E.com. But when I go to Save now, if I go to the File, uh, the file tab here and I choose Save As, Notice how in this first panel, the Save As panel, I now have a OneDrive option. I have the ability to save things now not only on my computer, which is what's currently selected, so you're seeing folders that exist on my computer, but I also can save it into the cloud, into my OneDrive account. Now, I happen to have two. If you are in a, an organization that's running Office 365, you will have a OneDrive account for business set up as part of that. Uh, and then and, you know, when you're working remotely, you'll work access Office 365 in the cloud. And when you're working in your office, you would use Office 2013, which is what I'm doing now. So this is my business account. But this is my personal one. The personal one is free. So like I said, anybody can set that up. And then you also can connect SharePoint sites if you're running that in your organization, which is what this is. So I have the ability to save in more places than just my computer or a drive that's attached to my computer. So if I went to the OneDrive, you simply sign into the account. Oops. And then you add your password. And now you see it says OneDrive for personal. And now when I click on it, you're viewing folders that I have set up on my OneDrive account. And I can also click Browse, and I can browse the folders there. And saving to the OneDrive account now becomes exactly like saving to the local computer. So really cool that it's just built right in here to my, my Save As component of the File tab. And again, that's resident across all of Office. So those are two things I wanted to share about uh, a couple things you can do across all of the applications. Since I'm in PowerPoint, I'll just continue here and talk about some of the features that are new within Office. One of them is around object formatting. So I already showed you the task pane that will pop up, but I don't know if you noticed when I right-clicked here to choose Format Shape, did you notice this little option that popped up? I now have a quick menu just for formatting objects. So if I simply really quickly wanted to change the fill color, I don't need to go all the way up to the ribbon or access the task pane. I can come directly to here and just quickly give it a different filling color. Same thing with the outline. I can come here and maybe I want to change the color of the outline or perhaps change the weight. I can make changes on this really fast by using this brand new little right mouse click quick menu that's going to pop up. And so that's for formatting objects which I think is pretty fantastic. Another thing that I can do here is, oops, let me just get rid of, I'm actually going to open up a different presentation because I think it's, we're going to see better with a different couple more slides here. Okay, so I just opened up a new presentation that has a few more slides in it, and I want to talk about some new design themes that are available. So design themes in PowerPoint, we access from the design tab. And these are those templates that we can use to give our presentations interesting and dynamic looking backgrounds. So you can see I've got a few design templates here. And what I really want to show you is when I pick one of these design templates, of course they pretty much function like they did in the other versions. They change the appearance of all the slides in the presentation. But what, I, what is new and what I want to call your attention to is this section here. Do you see it's called Variants? There are now several versions of each design theme. So do you see how there are some with lighter backgrounds and some with dark backgrounds? So maybe I like this particular design template, but I need one that's going to have a dark background. And just so you know, whether you have a dark background or a light background, 
usually is based upon the lightness or the darkness of the room in which you are presenting. So if I walked into a, a room in which I was going to have to give a presentation and there were no windows and we were going to have to dim all the lights to be able to run the LCD projector, I would really want to make sure I had a dark background for my slide. And the idea behind that is all your foreground elements will jump off the screen and that's really the point that you want to make. And if the room was really light, if they had windows that couldn't be closed, then you would want to have a lighter background. So the fact that I've got these variants available at the tip of my fingers is really convenient. The other thing that I can do with these variants when I click on this gallery to descend it is maybe I basically like this variant, but I'm not really thrilled with the colors. I can come right here to colors and I can swap out a different color scheme just by clicking on it. Or maybe I like the colors, but I'm not crazy about the fonts that are being used. I can come here and quickly select a different font set. So the ability for me to make these global changes off of my design theme I think is really handy. It really widens the scope of the design themes that you have. So though, although it may not seem like I have, well actually I do have quite a few, um, but it might not seem like I have that many design themes, but when you couple that with all of the different variants that are available, suddenly I really have many, many options for these uh, particular themes that I have. And some of them, I know I've certainly heard this from students in the past, they didn't really think some of the design themes were very practical based on the colors that were there. So for instance, this one's quite purple. If I really liked the design of it but just didn't care for the colors, well now I have all these variants that I can pick from that might be more palatable and, and more uh, applicable for me to use. So definitely something for you to check out. I think that's a big improvement within PowerPoint. But my favorite new feature in PowerPoint, far and away, is what's called the presenter view. Now, unfortunately, I can't easily show you what the presenter view looks like, um, but I have a PowerPoint slide that's going to show it to you. So essentially what happens is this. If I were giving this presentation, of course, I would drop myself into slideshow mode, where you could see the full screen, the full image of the slide on the screen. And that's, of course, what you would be projecting out through an LCD projector. Now the question becomes, what do we see on the laptop or the computer that we as the speaker are operating? In the past, it would simply be a replication of this. But now what we're going to have access to, and I'm going to just break out of here for a second. Now what we're going to have access to on our computer is this right here. This is called the, the presenter view. And what it's going to show me is, in the big image that's on the screen in front of me, this right here, this is what the users are going to see. So that's the slide image that's being projected. This image over here is showing me, as the speaker, what slide is going to come next. So that's really handy to have, because sometimes you want to you know, prepare or have an idea of what's coming next, or you're not exactly sure which slide comes next. As a speaker, I can see what I'm currently talking about and what I'm going to have to talk about next. Beneath this panel that shows the next slide, these are speaker notes about the current slide. So this is everything that I would want or need to say about this slide. Now there is not a scroll bar here because this is the conclusion of the notes, but if, this, if there were more speaker notes, I'd have a scroll bar that I could scroll through this. And I also have a big A and a little A down here in case I need to bump up the size of these letters. I don't know about some of you, but my vision isn't what it used to be. And I definitely take advantage of that and bump up the size of the letter so I don't have to struggle to see it. I also absolutely love this counter up in the corner. I sometimes feel like I could talk forever and ever and ever about some of the subjects that I, I have the opportunity to speak on. And this little guy right here keeps me honest about how much time I'm spending on each slide. So I think that's really, really important. I also have some great options down here that allow me to do things like annotate the slide. So that's what this pen is. If I wanted to access a highlighter or a marker to draw arrows, I have the ability to do that right from there. And I can draw them right on the slide. This would take me to thumbnails of all of the slides. So what that's going to allow me to do is see small images of all the slides in the presentation in case I quickly need to jump to one of them, which is pretty fantastic. And this allows me to zoom in on a section of a slide so that if, for instance, I wanted to call attention to just one part of the slide, I can use this and zoom in really close. 
I find that to be extremely handy when I'm working with uh, a chart or a graph. Sometimes we can get all the information on one slide, but it's really tiny. I can show a full slide image with the entire chart and then use this little zoom icon to be able to drop in and really isolate or highlight one particular facet of it. And I think I have, I'm just going to escape out of here for a second. This actually goes on for quite a while, but I wanted to show you a couple of slides here. So here's an example of the highlighter options that are available when I click on that pen. This here is going to show us what the thumbnails are going to look like. This is what it would break down to. So I love this view because if I need to quickly jump ahead, let's say a, a person in the audience said, Pam, remember on the slide where you had the pyramid? Can we talk about that again? I could come directly to the thumbnail view. Keep in mind, the audience is not seeing this. Only I am. I could then double click on the image of the pyramid and quickly show that to the audience. So it would seem to them like I, at a moment's notice, was able to just zip back up the slide in question. And then I could return to this view to return to whatever slide I was in the, in the process or the progress of the presentation. So this is a really cool feature. And then this is the zoom option I was telling you about. It allows me to zoom in or isolate just one portion of the slide. So those are some of the features that are new within PowerPoint. And by far and away, I think this presenter view is probably the big ticket item for me within PowerPoint. It has really revolutionized the way that I'm able to give presentations. Uh, it certainly, I have worked with a couple of other people who are more hesitant or nervous about speaking in public, and it's given them great peace of mind to be able to have so much information on their screen that the audience isn't seeing. So I think if you get, are someone who gives a lot of presentations, I think you're going to find this to be a really exciting new feature. Okay. So that's going to take us through PowerPoint. I want to jump into Excel now. I know a lot of people are big Excel users, and there are a couple of really fabulous things we can do with an Excel. So I'm just going to open up an Excel file. So here is an example I want to talk to you about. So one of the new features that's really exciting is called Flash Fill. Flash Fill allows Excel to take a look at the examples of what you input, and it will pick up and follow your lead. So it's, people say, well, is it like autofill? And I'm like, well, a little bit in that Excel can follow the lead or see the pattern or the series of a list, but it's much smarter than autofill. And really, I find that it's a great replacement for the text formulas or the text functions that we used to use to clean up spreadsheets. So for any of you who might work with um, spreadsheets that other people input data into, or maybe you get data dumps out of databases or other mainframe computers, oftentimes those come in really sloppy. Uh, you can see that example here. In this column, we have some names that have not been inputted with proper capitalization. And you can see that I've got a corrected name column here. Well, in previous versions of Excel, we would have corrected that using this function that I'm showing within this text box. So we would have to fill in a function, make the change, and then there's all these other things you have to do about copying it and then pasting just the value to delink it from the formula so you could delete the original column. It was doable, but it was kind of sloppy. Now, what I'm going to be able to do is this. Watch this. I'm going to delete this. In the corrected name column, I'm going to type the first name, Avery, in the manner in which I want it to be displayed. I'm going to hit my Enter key to go to the next column. And now I'm going to start to type the name Babcock correctly. And do you see what it did? I've stopped typing at this point. I just typed a capital letter B, and Excel says, oh, I see what she's doing. She's putting initial capitals of all the words that are in the previous column. Well, I can finish that for her. And if that is indeed what I want, I'm simply going to hit my Enter key, and it's going to fill in the rest of the column. So huge, huge, huge time saver for anybody who has to do any kind of cleanup like this. And just to show you a couple of other examples of this, Here's uh, something that we used to do, again, with another fu uh, text formula called right. There's also the equivalent called left. I don't really need to use this anymore because now what I'm going to be able to do 
is just type in what I want. So in this example, we've got in the first column a location code and a product code on the same line. And I want to separate just the product code. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm simply going to type in that first cell 21A, because that's the product code, hit my Enter key, start to type 22B in the next cell, and again, it's saying, oh, I see what she's doing. She's just isolating the last three characters from the previous column. I'll finish that for her. I hit Enter. It's going to fill it the rest of the way. It can also do things like, I'm going to uh, jump over here to some additional options. It can also do things like over here. So far, I've only worked with one column. Let's take a look at three columns. So you can see I've got uh, last name, first name, and middle name. And what I really would like, the way I want this displayed, is I would like it to be last name, comma, oops, last name, comma, first name, and then middle initial. That's the way I'd like it to display. So I'm going to show it the first example. I'm going to hit my Enter key. I'm going to type in the second example, and do you see how it located them? I'm going to hit my Enter key. But now you see that it didn't do two of these options, and that's because they didn't have middle initials. They didn't have middle names, so I wasn't exactly sure what to do with those. So it filled in the ones that it understood, and it skipped the ones that it didn't understand. Now, I can go back right now and instruct in Excel how I want it to handle these options where there is no middle initial. Oops. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to type in last name, comma, first name, hit my Enter key, and we'll just skip middle initial for those who don't have it. And watch what's going to happen for Ethan Dobbs key. As soon as I show it how to handle the first initial, uh, the first example where there's no middle initial, it's then going to say, okay, now I know what to do with the rest of them, and it's automatically going to fill them in for me. So I think this is really a fantastic, fantastic feature. And the other things you can see here with phone numbers and dates of birth, I just wanted to show you that you can do things like if a phone number has been inserted just as a giant blob of numbers, you can come back in and correct it in the first example and then as soon as I move down to the next one and hit that open parenthesis, it'll automatically recognize what I want and correct the rest of them. So that's, I think, the cool thing that we have the ability to do here with Flash Fill. Definitely something to check out. Um, super helpful, again, with any spreadsheets you need to clean up, I find. The next thing I want to show you in Excel is called Quick Analysis. So let me just open up a spreadsheet here that's perfect for a Quick Analysis. So I am going to select a block of cells here that have some information in it. And do you see how once I stop highlighting, I've got this new icon that's going to appear in the corner. This is the quick analysis icon. And when I click on it, it's going to open up a menu that's showing me quick ways that I can add formatting, quick ways that I can chart, quick ways that I can add totals or turn this into a table or add spark lines. So the way this works is, let's start with totals. By highlighting that information, I may now know, I may realize, okay, you know what, I want to see totals for this. If I click sum, do you see how it added this line here at the bottom? So it automatically did a sum line for me based off of just clicking that icon. If I hit this again, let me just, just hit undo to take me back to a blank option there. I could do the same thing and I could quickly get the average. If I do formatting, maybe what I want to see is within this highlighted area, I want to see what, uh, who's greater than, in this case it's doing, uh, it's sort of looked at what sort of the middle range is here and it's, it's taking a look at who's greater than a certain number. But I can type in a number, maybe I want to say who's greater than 40,000. And you can automatically do that for me. Okay, so again, that was right here from formatting. So this is conditional formatting options, basically, are what, we look, what we're looking at. I can also clear formatting directly from here as well. The other thing that I love, and I get this question a lot in Excel classes, people will want to, um, people will want to be able to chart or build a chart off of information within an Excel spreadsheet. 
but they're not exactly sure which type of chart they should use based on their data. So if we were going to add a chart, we'd have to go up to the Insert tab, and you'd have all your chart options right here in the middle. What I can do now is using this quick analysis and going to Charts, it's basically saying that these options it's showing me right here is what Excel recommends based on the data I'm showing it. So Excel has take a, taken a look at my data and said, you know what, okay, based on what I'm seeing here, these are going to be your best options for portraying what you want with, these, with this information. So it sort of takes the guesswork out of which type of chart is best. So I could choose clustered, and then it's quickly going to build a chart for me. So those are the quick analysis options that are available here within Excel. I think you're really going to love them. Uh, I find that particularly for things that I need to do quickly, I can access it very fast there instead of having to go all the way up to the ribbon. Even when I know what I want with a chart, sometimes I'll do it off of that quick option anyway, just because I can get directly to where I need to go without having to go all the way up to the menu. And one other thing I'm going to show you just quickly is, since we're here, I didn't have it on my agenda, but I'm going to show you anyway. <laughs> when you have a chart that you've built, do you see how I've got these three icons that appear here over on the right? Those are new. What these are going to allow me to do are quickly change the formatting for my chart right from here. Again, without having to go up to the Design tab and the Format tab under Chart Tools. I can access certain changes, certain formatting changes to apply to the chart directly from here. I can change the color if I want directly from here. The plus option allows me to add elements to the chart, so maybe what I want to add are data labels, which will put the actual numeric values at the top of each column. So again, without having to go all the way up here and, and make changes off of the design and the format tab, I can quickly enhance my chart right off of the right-hand side of the chart. And I, for one, really love that feature. I think it makes sense. It's smart. It's exactly next to the chart where I need to be, and I can, I can work much more efficiently now, I think, with some of the, the new ways in which Microsoft is laying out the options within 2013. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just throw it back to Kat for a second. I'm going to do that so I can bring up Outlook and uh, make sure that I have access to the mailbox I want to use to show you a couple of new features within Outlook. So Kat, if you want to... Uh, oh, okay, in. thanks. Thanks, Pamela. I appreciate it. I, I will be emailing everyone some information about Pam's courses, uh, as well as other titles that CompuWorks has to offer along with a 30% discount that you can use. And um, also be sure to share this with your colleagues who are not able to attend today's event. Uh, be sure also to browse the available courses on your partner site or Cogno.com directly. Alternatively, um, if you have any training need, you can always email me the topic, and I can provide you some recommendations and solutions uh, directly to help meet your need. You can email me at info at cogno.com, and I'm, I'm here to help. Uh, Pamela, back to you. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I could log into a different mailbox other than my own, which uh, my mailbox is a nightmare. This one's a little bit more manageable. So there's two cool things I'd like to show you in in Outlook. And the first one is on the View tab, I have access to the Reading Pane. It's not turned on right now. This is not new, the Reading Pane. It's been around for pretty much almost since the inception of Outlook. I'm going to click on Reading Pane, and I can either locate the panel, the Reading Pane panel, on the right or on the bottom. Most people, I find, turn it on on the right-hand side, because what it allows you to do then is still see the contents of your inbox. But now you can read the contents of the individual message you have selected on the right-hand side. So you can see that I have this message from Mark. As I click on other messages, you're going to see the panel, the reading panel, change. So again, like I said, none of this is new. That's all exactly still the same. But what is new now is I can work within this reading pane panel exactly as if I had double-clicked and opened up the message window by itself. Right? When I double click, I get the reply option, the reply all, I can forward, all of the things that I can do to the message I can gain access to right off of the ribbon uh, up at the top of the message. 
But now within this reading pane, look right here. I can reply within here, I can reply to all, I can forward the message, and if you're running Microsoft Link within your organization, I can also instant message Mark directly with my response back. And the way this is going to work is, let me go ahead and hit reply right now. I love this so much. It actually is going to open it up within the same reading pane window. Again, it's not going to open up another window. I'm just going to stay right here, and I can type my reply. And then I can hit, hit, simply hit send. Pop out means that it would pop out into the typical separate window. That's all that would mean. And discard would be if I wanted to cancel this without sending it. I'll go ahead and send that. Great. And that's an example of how I can use this new reading pane and have access to these icons directly within this panel, which I think is so fantastic. I love it. Another thing I wanted to show you is this item right here. Do you see how when I hover on Mark's picture, I get this little card that pops open. This is called the People Card, and it's not exactly new. We've actually had it for the last version of Office, but its appearance, and again, honestly, I'm showing you this in Outlook, but this kind of could have fallen under the heading of something that's available across all of Office, because really anywhere that you see a person's name or their profile image, you can hover on it and get access to this card. And what this card does is it's going to give me icons to quickly send an instant message to someone. If you're using Link, you have to be using Link to access this. I could call Mark. Again, if you're using Link, this is connected to Microsoft Link. I could start a video call through Link. <laughs> and again, if you're not using Link, it doesn't mean this card is irrelevant to you because this guy right here would allow me to quickly send an email message to Mark. So that means if I need to email Mark, I don't have to come back to the inbox and click the new icon and do all of that to get access to a new message. If I am anywhere where his name or profile pops up, I can hover on it, get this card, and quickly start a brand new message to him. The other thing I can do from here, let me just get that card back for a second is if I had more than one email address for Mark, you're going to see those listed from a drop-down arrow. So sometimes that's true for certain individuals. It's not just one email that it's connected to. You'll actually be able to see all emails that are connected to somebody's profile. And this carrot right here will open this up to a much bigger panel that would allow me to do things like um, see their uh, other source information. So if I'm connected to, to them through Facebook or LinkedIn or SharePoint, I can gain access to their profiles there. I can see other information about the individual. And I also can edit from here. So if this is a contact that I have, I can edit this information. And I could, for instance, add an address and save that. All right, in all the information. There we go. So I can add an address directly from here really easily. The other thing that's cool about this is I have a little push pin here. If I click that, it means the card is going to stay open. Now what that means is if I were to uh, minimize Outlook, for instance, okay, I, still, I can still have the card here. So I can leave this card open. Even if I close Outlook, I can still have the card open. Now that's different than if, let me just pull Outlook back up for a second. I'm going to pull Mark's card up. If I remove the push pin, when I click away, you can't see this here, but basically, let me just minimize this again, the card is gone. So it's, I'd have to open it back up again. So the fact that I can have those cards remain open, I think is really handy and convenient. And it's great because you're going to see, like I said before, these people cards, you're going to find them in other places across Office, which means that I can quickly send email messages or instant messages if I'm running link to anybody that I have contact information for. So it becomes a very, very handy tool, I think. And one other thing I'm going to show you, I got a couple extra tips. I'm going to throw in one extra thing. One thing that I love in this new version of Outlook is over here on my folder list, 
and I'm going to expand my inbox because I have a couple of folders that I've created under my inbox. In previous versions of Outlook, the folder list was alphabetical. So meaning as I added new folders, they would fall into alignment in alphabetical order. What I can do now, though, is I can pick up any folder that I want, and I can drag it into different orders. So my folders can be listed in whatever order I want. And that goes for these standard folders, too, the Outlook folders themselves. So if I want my sent items to be closer to the top of this list, I can drag it up. Maybe I never use uh, the Outbox I don't really care about. I'm going to drag that down here near the bottom. Conversation history, that's because we're running link. I can move that down. So I have control over what order those folders come in now. And that's not ever been the case before. We used to sort of hack it by putting in numbers or uh, characters, like an asterisk at the beginning of a folder name if I, we wanted to make sure it would come near the top of the list. You don't have to do that anymore. You can create a new folder, name it logically, anything that makes sense, and then just drag it into whatever order is going to make sense for you. So really a great new feature and a fantastic option, I think. Okay, so let me jump over to Word because we've got some pretty cool things I want to show you in Word. Open up the Word document for you. Okay, so here we are in a, a Word document, and one of the things that I want to show you is collapsing and expanding headings. This particular document, if we look at it, we can see that it has a title. It has a secondary subtitle here called Using the Sun and Shadows. We've got shadow tip methods. As I scroll through, you can see there's another sublevel. Here we've got these big, big uh, subheadings again. So this particular document is using these heading styles, so paragraph styles that are built into Word. And paragraph styles aren't new. They've been around for, gosh, I don't even know, decades now within Word. And basically, they're, they're pre-created named styles that you can apply to different portions of your document. So you can see if I click on Wilderness Navigation, it has heading 1 assigned to it. Using the sun and shadows, it has heading 3 applied to it. If I click on Shadow Tip Methods, it has heading 4 applied to it. But look what happens when I hover on top of using the sun and shadows. Do you see how that little gray carrot appears there? If I click that, I can collapse all of the information that exists underneath this heading. See how I just did that? That means I could do the same thing for using the moon. I could do the same thing for using the stars. And you can collapse your whole document until it only is showing you the major headings. The nice thing about this is, again, imagine if this document were really, really large. You don't have to view or scroll through the entire document when you're working on it or editing it. You can collapse portions of it and then expand only that bit you're going to work on. The same thing is true with these smaller levels underneath. So see how I'm able to collapse those? All of the information is still there. I, I haven't lost it. I'm just saying I don't particularly need to see or want to see it all right now. So it makes it, I think, easier to manage large documents, uh, easier to move around and navigate. I think it's a great addition that they added to here to Word. One of the other things I wanted to show you within Word is our ability now to edit PDFs. Yes, you heard that right. You now can take a PDF someone said you, sent to you open it up within Word, have Word convert it so that you can work in it, and then you can save it back as a PDF again if you want. You don't have to have separate Acrobat software to do that anymore. And the way that's going to work is I'm just going to come up to the File tab, and I'm going to choose Open. And I'm going to open up here, look at this file right here. It's actually the same document I just showed you, except this is a PDF version. I'm just going to select it. Oops. Okay, so now I'm going to get this message, which basically Word is saying it's going to convert the PDF to an editable Word document, and it may take a while. So I'm just going to click OK. In this case, it shouldn't take too terribly long. Depending on the length of the document, it can take a longer time. So it did just convert it. Now, the way that it opened up is it's in the reading mode, which you'll see sometimes within Word, and you might be familiar with it if you're using Word 2010. Word 2010 would open in reading mode. Uh, I can just hit the escape key, and it's going to drop me down 
into a normal working view. Now, you're probably saying, okay, well, this is the same document, but it's not, because look at the title bar up here, wildernessnavigation.pdf. So it opened this as a PDF, and I can come in here now, and I can delete things, I can add more text if I want, and I can do whatever I need to. And then when I'm done, and I want to save this again as a PDF, I can just come back up to File, I can choose Save As, and we can put it into whatever folder we want, and then what I'm going to do down here under Save As Type is I'm just going to save it as a PDF. And since I made edits here, I'm just going to call this version 2. There we go. I hit Save. And now here it is, my new updated version. It's now it's showing me this in Adobe Reader. It's a PDF, and there's the change I made. So no longer do we have to use separate software to be able to come in and edit a PDF. I can do it directly out of Word. I can't tell you how often this has saved me since Word 2013 has come out. And I've got, um, I'm almost out of time, but you know what, there was one other thing here in Word that I just have to show you. It wasn't on my list, but if I had time, I knew I was going to. I don't know how many of you use comments, but this particular document does have a comment in it. So that's, this is what a comment is. And basically the way that they work is you would highlight the portion of the document that you wanted to comment on. And on the review tab, there's a new comment button. You click it, it opens up a little panel, and then you can say whatever you want about that particular bit of the document. So we use these a lot, not only when collaborating with other people, but also I use them for myself, too, if there's notations I need to make to myself within a document. Comments are not new. What is new is this. So this was the original comment that existed in this file when I opened it. Previously, if I were collaborating with someone, and they left a comment, and I wanted to reply or respond to that comment, I would have to do so in a totally new and separate comment box, which became a little bit diff difficult sometimes to associate my reply with the original comment. Now, in this comment, look at this little icon right here. When I click on that, it's going to allow me to comment within the comment. So you can begin to have an internal conversation and dialogue about certain parts of files as you're collaborating and working together. And if I send this back to the original author and they wanted to comment as well, they could do the same thing. They could keep continuing to comment on my comment and back and forth. So this is just a tremendous new feature, I think. And again, although I'm showing this to you here in Word, comments are available across all of Office, and this the ability to reply inside of comments is also available in all the other applications as well, and I personally love it. And on that note, Kat, I think I've left us about 10 minutes for questions if anybody has them, and I don't know if I want to, if you want to uh, moderate that or how you'd like to do that. Okay, thanks, Pamela. If anyone has any questions that you wanted to pose to Pamela about Office 2013, there is a chat feature on your GoToMeeting panel. Uh, that should be on the right-hand side of your screen. And you can enter in your questions, and Pamela can address those. But Pam, Pamela, I have received a couple questions um, that I'll just go ahead and read to you. Uh, but in the meantime, if anyone has any others, you can go ahead and enter those in, and, and we can get those addressed. So I have this one question that came through to say, how do you set up a OneDrive? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So to set up a OneDrive, if you, I'm going to bring up a browser here for a second. Uh, you can simply go to the, the website www.one, that's O-N-E, the, the word one, drive, D-R-V-E dot com, onedrive.com, and it's going to take you to this particular website. And you can see here there's a sign up button at the bottom. You're, they're going to give you 15 gigabytes of space. And I would just hit sign up. And the personal account is always free. Business, ultimately, you know, they're trying to sell you a business account. So I would just hit sign up for free for the personal account. You fill in a little bit of personal information, and you click create account, and that's it. That's all there is to it. And you have your 15 gigabytes of access available to you. And really, of course, Kat, what they're doing with this is they're trying to compete with um, the Google Drive. So Google's uh, free option and 
free cloud share and all other free applications. They're trying to compete with that. So, and it's a it's great because it plugs right into Office. So I find it to be super helpful. Oh, that's excellent. Okay. Um, the other question that I have here is, looks like okay. Can you customize the new weather bar in Outlook? Oh, uh, I didn't mention that, but yes. Let me show you this cool feature. So here in Outlook, if I were to go to the calendar. So I've got a couple of calendars open right now, but if you look underneath the ribbon, there's a line here that shows you the forecast for the next three days for whatever location you've set here. So you can see I'm here in Boston, so I can see what the weather is going to be like for the next few days. I don't know where all of you are located, but for us here, that weather looks fantastic. I feel like I just moved to Florida. If I click on this drop-down arrow, you can see that I could switch it to a couple of other locations here, and these are I've got an office location and a home location here in this area for me. But I also have add location. So if I click that, it's going to open up a window, and let's say I want to add uh, Los Angeles. I would type in Los Angeles and hit enter, and it's going to show me results for that. And there's Los Angeles, California. And now I've added that. And suddenly our weather doesn't look quite as nice. And you can see that when I click the drop-down arrow, I haven't lost Boston or my other couple of locations. I can switch back and forth between them. And Microsoft actually will allow you to hold up to five locations within here. So if you get more than five, you know, you're going to need to have somebody drop off. And to remove somebody, all you're going to do is hover on top of the location, and you'll, a little X will appear. And when I click that X, it will remove that location. So you can see now I'm back to three and it would free me up to add another if I wanted to. So that's a fun little addition. Also, I'll just say that there, there is, uh, it's not part of the standard installation of Office, but there are now third-party add-ins if you wanted to uh, connect one of those so that you could have access to other types of weather services. They have basically plugins now to manage that bar for you, so you can, you can uh, sort of trick that out a little bit. And you can just do a search for those online, and you can, you can find a lot of them. OK, great. We have another question that has come in. How do you delete a comment in the document? Sure. So let me pull back up my one with the comment here. OK, so to delete a comment, there's a couple ways you can do it. So you can click on the comment. That's going to select it so Word knows which one you're working on. And then on the Review tab, there's a Delete button. You can just click the delete button and it'll disappear. The other thing you can do, I'm just going to undo to bring that back, is you can also right mouse click on top of the comments and there's a delete option there as well and that'll remove it. Okay, great. Another question we have is how do you password protect on Excel sheets or file? So, the way that you're going to do that is um, if you're talking about, I don't know if you're, are you talking about, are we talking about protecting cells? I'm going to assume that's probably what we mean. So in Excel, just to explain to folks, you have the ability to lock down access to certain cells. So in other words, somebody could, I could have somebody open up this spreadsheet and maybe I wanted them to be able to change these numbers, okay, because it's the raw data that people are going to be filling in, but I don't really want them altering the formulas or changing any of the labels or doing anything else other than simply being able to alter the contents of these cells that I have highlighted. What I can do is if I go to the Home tab, there is a Format option here near the end, and there's an option down here at the bottom where it says lock cell. All cells in all spreadsheets are locked. Okay, it's sort of like adding a, a lock to the door of your house, right? Your, your house has a lock, but the lock isn't engaged until you turn the key, until you protect it. So while all these cells are currently locked, I've not yet turned the key. So what I'm going to need to do, since I want somebody to be able to enter information in these cells, is I'm going to remove the lock so that when I turn the key, these remain open. Okay, so remember, these are the cells that I just removed the lock from. Now if I go up to Format and I choose Protect Sheet, 
I have the ability to add a password here. So I'm going to say password. And the only thing that users are going to be able to do to the locked cells of this sheet are basically select them. That's it. That's the only thing they can do to cells that are locked. So I'm going to click OK. It's going to make me type in the password again, of course, so I don't have a typo. All right, so now this sheet is locked. Now, by all appearances, I can click on it and everything seems fine. But when I go to click in one of these cells that I didn't to remove the lock from and I start typing, I'm going to get an error message to say, this is a protected sheet. You cannot make changes to that cell. But these cells within here that I said were OK, that I removed the lock from, if I click on one of these and start typing, it will allow me to change the information within that cell. So pretty cool. And then, of course, if I have this file open and I go to Format and I choose Unprotect Sheets, if I don't know the password, I cannot unlock this sheet. I have to know what that password was to be able to gain access to all the cells on the sheet. And that was all under Home Format, Protecting the Sheet and Locking Cells. Okay, great. I hope that answered your question. And another question that has come in is, is there a way to make Office 2013 work easier with a touch screen versus a mouse? Yeah, so of course not everybody has, well not everybody, but a lot of people have uh, tablets and those are used uh, with, the, with your finger to touch or with the stylus. Some of you may even have monitors that are touch enabled. So as we start moving in that direction, Microsoft wanted to have Office be available and workable under both a mouse and keyboard scenario and a touch or stylus scenario. So in any of the Office applications, if you go up to the, the title bar, and at the very beginning there's this little tiny toolbar here that uh, came around in Office 2007. It's called the Quick Access Toolbar. If you click on the little drop-down arrow next to that, there's a command here called Touch Mouse Mode. If I turn that on, do you see how it's going to add an icon here? What this icon is going to allow me to do is toggle back and forth, making this either touch ready. So now you can see that by turning on the touch option, everything sort of spread out a little bit. It's a little bit wider making it easier for me to use my finger or a stylus to land exactly on the icon that I'm trying to touch. Or if I go back to it, I can revert to mouse and you can see how everything is tighter, more condensed. We're taking, we're taking, um, we're putting more information in the, it, across the real estate on the screen. So you would just basically, if, if you were um, working on a computer that was sometimes, or sometimes you used it touch, touch enabled, you just want to turn that particular icon on the Quick Access Toolbar on on your Office applications, and then you can just toggle easily back and forth between the two choices. Okay, great. Well, very simple, very easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, those are all the questions that I have. Um, if anyone else has any questions you wanted to uh, pop into chat, do so now. Um, we just have about two minutes uh, left of the webinar, so. Um, if you wanted to pop your question in so Pamela can address it, that'd be great. Um, if you think of any questions that you have afterwards uh, that you wanted to present to Pamela, feel, feel free to just email me directly with that, and I'll get that to Pamela, and then she can provide an answer to you. Um, and again, I, I want to remind everyone um, that I am going to be sending an email after the webinar with a 30% discount on any of Pamela's and CompuWorks courses, so you can take advantage of those. This course, uh, the uh, new features and functions of 2013, uh, the actual course in its entirety will be available soon on, on the uh, Cogna website and your partner website as well. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, today we're, we were only able to cover about 40 minutes of the actual content, but there's a lot more to cover on the full class that uh, will be available soon to purchase. I don't see any more questions coming in at this time, Pamela. Is there anything uh, else that you wanted to provide in, um, in closing for today? 
Well, I would just like to thank everybody for your attention. I really appreciate it. Um, I had a great time. I love talking about this. And Kat, thank you so much for moderating it and inviting me. No, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been very helpful today, so I do appreciate it. Again, thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar hosted with uh, Cogno and CompuWorks. Again, be on the lookout for the email that I'll be sending later today. Feel free to email me at info at Cogno.com with any questions about training courses available or partnering with Cogno. Thank you so much. I hope to see you all at a future webinar event, and have a great day.